Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. I, uh, I had to see the praise man there for a second. I looked and said, get back into that real quick. And um, I told him a few weeks ago, I was like, look, man, I said, I'm not trying to be ugly, but uh, man, I believe you're talented enough that you could you could actually go in and play all the drums and all that stuff in the background and mix it and, uh, and bring that in and bring that into the to the service on Sunday morning and mix it and play it in and then Travis can have that guitar and it would be a whole lot more full sound. So we're thankful for that. That's the first. I hope the minute to come, but uh, if you see the little tape on the laptop and all that stuff, he actually went in and recorded the, he did a organ and synthesizer bass and drums and uh, mixed them all together and ran it through his laptop and so that's why you were able to see Travis play guitar and it sounded like a full band up here. It wasn't a track that they bought. They actually did it, and so we have a lot of talent. I'm thankful for that, and uh, and Travis can tear that guitar up. I'm thankful for that too. Amen. And Shannon can sing. I love her. I told uh, many pastor friends of mine she's our resident Pentecostal and praise man because when she gets into singing, she really believes it. If you don't believe that, watch her as she's led by the Holy Spirit too. So, um, any birthdays or anniversaries this week? Miss Hilda, I got to confess to you. I told you the other day when I was at your house, I was 43. I'm getting ready to be 44 and I forget things. I got in my car and I said, well, I'm actually 44. I'm getting ready to be 45, so I definitely forgot. So, um, but I, I, wanted to, uh, I, I wanted to ask Jonathan. I taught our Sunday school class this morning and I couldn't remember what he told me the other day. What was that that you shared with me that you read in that book that was uh, about the percentages of Christians that read or people that read that will read the Bible in a day? Out of 100 people, one will read the Bible. The other 99 will read the Christian. Yeah, I thought that was good. That's powerful. We'll read the Christian. One will read the Bible. The other 99 will read the Christian. And so, I, we were talking about it the other day, and I was like, man, we have got to, we've got to grab a hold of that and understand. We were talking about it in our Sunday school class about the discipleship and things, too. And, uh, and so, that's where it's at, honestly. And so, I just wanted him to share that with you this morning because I believe... Uh, God is powerful and He has something in store for every one of us. He has a call in every one of our lives. And, uh, and if you believe that, just want to say amen. amen. How about touch your neighbor this morning and say, God's got a plan? Touch your neighbor this morning and say, God's got a purpose. Touch your neighbor this morning and say, He's even got a purpose when we get out at 3 o'clock. Uh, but anyway, I hope you'll come back this evening uh, for our fall festival. Invite someone and things too. Um, and then, uh, and out of that, we want to reach out to. So if you're here and you're working that, if you haven't signed up to work it, uh, there's more places to work out there. Sign up, please. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I need uh, three people. I uh, need Dustin, Alex, and Jonathan. Uh, who it is? I need three people to be uh, judges for our costume contest tonight. Um, if you would do that, um, not children, uh, preferably adults. Um, but if you would, um, if you're interested in doing that, um, there's a sign up back there, or just let me know one or the other. But I only need three people. Um, so if you would, um, go back there and sign up for that. And also, um, you got two right here. All right. Um, also, uh, there will be a uh, a pie contest tonight, and uh, and I need uh, I'm going to be in it myself, but I need uh, four other, uh, preferably men folk or women folk. If y'all want to be involved in that too, um, you can. But I'll do it. I think I see Stevens hanging up too. That's all right. That's all right, right there. Yes. Yeah, all right. right. Cool. So Stevens said he volunteered. Y'all saw his hand up. Did you see his hand up? <laughs> That's the bad thing about having broken in and everything else. So. Huh? So, I'm going to, uh, I don't think that's written back there. Um, maybe it may not be, I'm not sure. Um, but I think I've already got two or three people already signed down. I'm going to write their names down and the last other two, then 
it's a race to get back there and write your name down. So, um, but I don't knock it by overdose. I know there's going to be uh, good pies because Miss Miss Kathy Turner, she um, she actually volunteered to make those for us. So um, I know they're going to be good. So uh, there's a special prize for the winner. And we will make it the best we can make it. If it rains us out and everything this afternoon, we'll make it the best we can make it inside and all too. Um, but also too, we want to use it honestly, not just as something that, to give someone an alternative to Halloween and all that stuff and everything too. We're not celebrating that. We want to give it an opportunity to invite them to church. And, uh, and we have several in our church that, that actually, the reason why they're here, including myself, was that somebody that were invited. Somebody just invited them. And uh, so just in, invite people, uh, and, and if you see people that you don't know, walk up and introduce yourself, you know. Tell them you go to church here, unless you're ashamed of it, and you are, then just keep that to yourself. So, um, But uh, let them know that, you know, that, that we're crazy and we're sold out for the Lord. If you can't tell them anything else, good, just tell them your pastor's a nutcase. I mean, really, that, you know, that's all right, too. I don't mind. So uh, we want you to do that. We want you to be a part of that. We need everybody's participation to help out with that, too. To make it successful with that and I know that uh, we can't do it alone because three are stronger, two are stronger than one and three uh, can't be easily be broken and they're right Trisha and Jimmy. Welcome to Impact from the Honeymoon. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a coffee. coffee for them this morning, they're a little tired so. But uh, we're thankful that they didn't. Yes, yes. The Sunshine Club went out partying last night, so if you see any of them sleeping a little bit in here, um, it's okay. It's all right with it. They went, and uh, Elvis is alive. And so um, we just want to make sure y'all knew that. You know, there's a rumor going around that he is. He was in Cat State last night. And so uh, they got to go see him, too. So uh, thankful for that. Any other announcements? Any other things anybody wants to share this morning on your heart this morning? All hearts and minds clear? Good. We're going to ask our ushers to come at this time take a kiss to ice an hour for it.
point song that you think like
she step out on the water And they say it can't be done
seated and the children can be dismissed with their pictures at the time. We've got a children's church. Uh, my favorite part of that song is, is that, that last part. If you call us to the fire, if you call us to the fire, you would not withdraw your hand. And that's a promise that God's given us. And you know, I think our promise needs to really be the hymn that, that we'll gaze into that fire and we'll look for it. Because he didn't promise it'd be easy. He didn't promise it never call us to a fire. He didn't ever promise us that he would that everything would be peaches and cream. He, as a matter of fact, uh, his own son, Jesus Christ, went through a turmoil on this earth. And a hellacious turmoil that none of us could even endure or, or partly endure. And so, you know, I think we need to remember that. And I think we need to remember that where we're at today, and, and, and you know, if, as we're going through this, this, this series of, of what now, we went through, you know, the revival and all that, and we've gone through, and if you missed and you're just coming in, we want to tell you where we're at in this. The first week we talked about love and God's love for us and, you know, how much that as parents we may love our children or how much you as boyfriend or girlfriend think you're in love or how much you as a husband or wife are in love or, or, or all these things, but that love pales in comparison to God's love for us. And if we don't understand God's love for us and we don't get the fact that God loves us so much in this unconditional love, then we will never really be able to live in the, to the purpose that God's called us to. Secondly, last week, you know, I remember what we talked about last week? Anybody? Nobody? Nobody went back and watched it this week or anything or took notes last week? There's two I know that are exempt from it. They're on their hunting league, so. I wouldn't be watching. Yeah, she was, oh, you you on your honeymoon too? All oh, right, that's all right. Miss Mavis is on her honeymoon too. That's all right. So and, and and Brenda was working. So anybody? Nothing. Come on now, I'm gonna wait just a minute. We'll see. It has to do with our life. It has to do with what goes on in our life. Before we became a Christian, and once we become a Christian, there has to be a transformation. There you go. Hey, we must be transformed. Go on, Matt. Hey, Matt, you get the prize today. <laughs> Honestly, you get the pie contest. I think, Matt, I think it'd be really good in that pie contest and everything, too, with that. So, um, Steve, you got off the <laughs> But, uh, but we must be transformed. We have to be transformed. And God is transforming us and the renewing of our mind and, and the renewing of our heart and of our soul. And, you know, if we're allowing God to do that and we realize that it's God that's doing that, then we understand that, you know what, we got to go. we got to go. And no, that's not a misprint, okay? That's not a misprint, G-O-T-T-A. I know if you type that into Word, it's going to tell you that that's not a Word. It's going to tell you to change it to got to, okay? But uh, I just wanted, as I, was, I was like, man, we got to be real, man. That's how I talk. Okay, if you send a text to somebody, most of you younger people, you always say God like that, right? And we gotta go. We gotta go. He's given us a task. He's given us something to do, and He's sending us, and He sent us, and He's told us to do something. And so, if we understand love and we understand the transformation that should happen in our life as a Christian, then we should understand the fact that He's told us to go. But too much the church today, us, all of us, the body of Christ, says stay, stay. Stay right where you're at. Don't, don't grow it all. Don't, don't change it all. Don't allow God to work in your life. Read your Bible because it's an obligation to read your Bible, not because you want to study it and learn about what God wants you to do and allow God to transform your life. Don't only pray when you're really in need because that's really the most times you really, really pray. But pray all the time without ceasing. Pray in the good times and the bad times. Praise Him in the good times and the bad times. Love Him in the good times and the bad times. Love others in the good times and the bad times. And when others crap all over you, still love them. Because we do it to Him. And the truth is, He's told us that we've become a church that is way too this way, okay? Which is what? Y'all know the little thing. This is the church. This is the steeple. Open it up and here's the people, okay? Wrong, okay? If your grandma or your mom taught you that, no. Okay? That's the church, okay? This is the church. The people are there. You understand that? You with me? The people are out there. The souls that are lost are out there. The people that need to hear the gospel are out there. 
And I will argue with people tooth and nail when it comes to the gospel itself. And I will tell you this, that he died that all might be saved. And the scripture says also, as you'll see today, you've got to understand that, they will not be saved unless they hear. <laughs> they must hear the gospel. So who shall be? Yours, preacher. Wrong. We talked about it last week. What is the pastor's job? To what? To equip the saints. To equip the saints, the Christians, to equip you to go out, to equip me to go out. And you know, I was, I was thinking about this week, I was thinking, you know, how many times somebody said to me, oh, preacher, man, that stepped all over my toes and everything. All you get is 30, 45 minutes, maybe an hour on Sunday if we really, really go over a lot. I've been getting it all week long. He's been nailing me with it all week. So, you know what? If you want to praise him about something today, praise him in the fact that he ain't been nailing you with it all week long. Because a pastor who actually does not, does not speak to cannot deliver that message, I promise you. If he does, I promise you, you can look right through it and see right through it. It's got to be real in his life. And it's got to be convicting in his life. And you know what? Here's the thing we got to understand, too. And I hope you really get this before you leave today. Is the last part of the sermon today will be on the fact, and it may offend you. i got to be honest with you. But if it offends you, so be it. I want to apologize for it. Because it offended me. If your toes are stepped on, good. They need to be stepped on. If the shoe fits, change shoes. Do something different. Because I believe God is tired of spiritual babies in the church. I believe God's tired of us running the babysit. It's said, you know, sometimes we you know we're running the babysit service at the church because people bring their kids and we just saw a slew of kids go out. People bring their kids and drop them off and everything too. And, and you know, we've become a babysitting service. I'll, let me submit this to you. We've not become a babysitting service for the children. We've become a babysitting service for adults. But you know what? They're looking to change. They want to change. They want to be poured into. They want to grow. And us as adults have already been setting our ways and we want everybody to meet our needs and to, and, to, and to conform to what we want them to do. And when they don't, we get all ticked off and we go to another church and find another church. You know what? What eventually happens is you take your nasty, dirty, rotten little luggage that you had here to another church and then you unpack that luggage there and then you have a problem there and then you get to another church and find it. And then in the end, honestly, you'll stand before God and you'll realize that the problem was not the church, the problem was you. It's time for us to understand maturity. And it's time for us to understand spiritual maturity. And the way we grow in that and the way we go is to understand these things today, honestly. I can tell you this, this was not what I had planned at all whatsoever. You can ask Linda. I had everything I told Chris about. What was crazy was Friday morning, I'm y'all know, I mean I ain't gonna lie to you, I don't I, I like to lay a tan bed, okay? And I like I like to tan. And so I was like, hey, you know what? I, I, I listen to sermons. That's where I'm here preaching and everything. And I was like, man. I get out and I'm like, all right, God, I can show you my phone in my notes on my phone where God gave me all the points for today. And I'd already had my points and everything down. I was like, what in the world, God, really? And then all of a sudden, Linda texts me and says, hey, are you okay? I thought you, I still hadn't received your sermon outline yet. And I was like, he's still going. He's powerful and he's God. You know what? And he was dealing with me in some of these things all week, but honestly, he changed some of these things and, and, and even over the weekend a bit. So I just want to share this with you today. From Matthew chapter 13, this will be our key text, but there will be other texts in there, so if you're taking notes, just write them down or put them in your phone or whatever you're taking notes on, and you can go back and look at them later. But Acts chapter 13, verses 2 through 4 says this, <clears throat> While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have... What's those two words? Say it with me. Say it with me called them. Alright, let's do that one more time. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Who said this? The Holy Spirit, which is who? God. Verse 3. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them sent on their way by who? The Holy Spirit. Went down to Seleucia and sailed over there, over from their disciples. That's our key text today. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you give us, God. We thank you for grace and mercy. I pray right now, God, that you pour into our lives and pour into our hearts today. I pray, Lord, that we would be open, Lord God, to what you have for us this morning. I pray, Lord, that you 
you would move in a mighty way here today, God. I pray that your Holy Spirit, or thank you for your Holy Spirit already being here today. And God, I just pray that you would just fill our hearts and minds with you when you want. And God, you're powerful. You're all knowing. You're all present. Lord, may we feel you today. May our lives be changed with you when we can do. We do ask, God, that you would be with us this afternoon in the weather, Lord. And that we would be able to have a fall festival today, God, that not to just celebrate and have a good time, but Lord, to reach our community, God. To have a chance to, to meet people and to invite them in there. Lord, that is, as, as Jonathan shared, Lord God, the one that reads their Bible out of a hundred and the ninety-nine that read Christian letters, would that them be us? Truly, that's what you want us to be. Amen. You, you know, many times, you know, we think about somebody says, well, you got to go, you got to go do this, you got to work for the Lord, you got you to do what He told you to do, and He's calling you, and He has a purpose for your life, He has a plan for your life, and all these things and things too, right? We've heard that a lot. You go to church, and that's what you hear all the time. And all of a sudden, we come up with things, and, 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 and these are excuses, okay? My excuses, your excuses, and so first of all, I want us to look at those. Number one is, you don't understand. You don't understand my past, preacher. You don't understand my past, friend in church. You don't understand where I've been, and what I've done, and what I've gone through, and what's happened in my life. You don't understand how bad I've been. You don't understand what I've done. You don't understand that I've committed murder. You don't understand that I've, I've committed adultery. You don't understand that I've... That I've that I've gone out and done all the drugs. You don't understand that part. You don't understand all that stuff about me. You don't understand it all. You don't understand where I've been from, where I come from. You don't understand the past. I want to share something with you today. In Genesis 37, Joseph was hated by his brothers and he told them about the dreams he had of them bowing down to him one day. And as he was talking to them about it, of course, his brothers were upset and didn't like him. They already didn't like him, right? Why? Because he was his father's what? Favorite. And then his father gave him a robe or a coat of what? Many colors. Ask God Dolly Parton. She can tell you about it. All right? A coat of many colors. And, and, then, and then all of a sudden, they, 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 they're, they're there and they go out to work. And, you know, he's, he's back. And, you know, the Scripture doesn't really tell us why he's back. But the brothers actually went out to work. And so as he's there, his father, Jacob, sends him out. And he goes out to check on his brothers. And as he goes out to check on his brothers, his father says, And you come back and tell me what they're doing. And where they're at. So almost like come town, right? So when they see him coming, what do they do? They plot to what? Kill him. <clears throat> now this is your brother. I want you to put yourself this morning in, in Joseph's perspective. They plot to kill him. And then all of a sudden, they end up talking to each other and they're like, well, you know, if we kill him, there's blood be on our hands, blah, blah, blah. Let's just do this. Let's just throw him in the cistern. And if you've ever been to Israel or anything, if you've ever seen pictures of it, they're very, very deep, and they're dark, and they're kind of nasty looking, and, and it's a water cistern. We've actually went down in one, and there was, you could just spill the mold and just smell it. It was terrible. And, and all of a sudden, they throw him in there, and then all of a sudden, they're like, okay, well, we could, we could just leave him down there. But well, then all of a sudden, his brother's going to, Reuben's going to come back, and he's going to, he wants to save him and all. But then his brothers get together, and, and I find this interesting. His brother Judah gets together, and he's like, hey, you know what? These traders come along, and they're like, hey, well, let's, let's, let's trade him up. Let's put him on Craigslist. This is my story, not yours. So let's just put them on Craigslist and sell them off and everything too. And so they came over to look at him and everything. They were like, oh, we'll, we'll take it, we'll take it. And so he traded them up, gave it to him, and they gave him some silver and everything too for it. And I find it really interesting that, that how the Bible correlates to that, that I think Jesus was betrayed and sold out for some silver too, right? So, so next thing you know, and, and this was one of his supposed brothers at the time too, right? So he's sold into slavery, and then he goes to, to he sold to Potiphar, which was the captain of, of Pharaoh's army, and he goes to into the house, and Potiphar's wife, if you don't know the story, I just want to give you a little background this morning. Hope you know it. But if Potiphar's wife, you know, she likes him and she comes on to him and all this stuff and everything. Well, he runs away from her and gets away, and, and she leaves and, and she holds on to something that he has. And when she when when she calls the guards and she yells and screams, and when she yells and screams, she tells him, Hey, he tried to rape me. So what did they do to Joseph? They locked him up and put him in prison. They locked him up and they put him in prison. Others and I may not know your past. You know what, friend? You may not understand my past. But God knows all of our past. God knew what was happening with Joseph. The Scripture says several times throughout the, the, the book of Genesis and the story of Joseph, if you look at chapter 38, 
and you go on and look at chapter 39 rather and you go on and see where he went it says several times in there the Lord was with Joseph throughout his entire journey the Lord was with him okay well check this out I want you to I want to paint a picture for us to really understand this this morning okay the Lord was with him but yet he was sold into slavery the Lord was with him but yet he, he, he was actually accused of, of rape the Lord was with him but he was thrown into prison you with me? Don't forget that. Though. Don't forget that. Because we're going to stop in the story of Joseph for right now. We're going to keep it up a little bit later. Because that's the desolate part. You don't understand my past, but the Lord does. You don't understand my struggle. You don't understand my struggle. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. I know I didn't finish that verse, but we're going to finish it this morning. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. Now, let that resonate just for a second, okay? You don't understand, Pastor, I've struggled with pornography, okay? My, my wife hasn't yet, but you're a man, and, and your eyes are, are, are what, you, what you focus with a lot of times, and they're, they focus with their emotions with things. We're physical. You don't understand, Pastor, I, I struggle with, 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 uh, with what I used to do in my life and let, and let my past go. You don't understand. I, okay, well, you've asked God to forgive you. Now it's time for you to forgive yourself, my friend. You, you don't understand, Pastor, my struggle of, you know, that, that when I smell a cigarette, God delivered me from it, I really want to go back to that cigarette. And let me make sure you understand something. Don't quote God here today and say, Pastor, Christian didn't smoke today. Okay, no, I didn't. Now, you ain't know where you've seen that in the Bible, okay? You don't even talk about smoking a cigarette in the Bible. Okay? Really? That's a personal conviction. But if God delivers you from it, He does not expect you to go back to it. Amen? Amen? And let me say this to you. There's huge testimony of many people I know of, myself included, that God delivered me from it, and I don't want to go back to it. But can I tell you something honestly? Let somebody light up a cigarette around me today, and I smell the first drag. Let me tell you what I say. Well, I like that. That's a good I ain't going to lie. Well, I love it. I Give me that cigarette right there. I smell so just the first of it, man. Once it gets on into it and gets into the clothes and stuff and everything, I'm like, hmm, it kind of stinks. Did I used to smell like that? But that first one, boy, whew. see the desire is still there, but the will of God that lives inside of me is stronger than that desire. See, you, you may suffer temptations and you may think that nobody else suffers with temptations, but according to Scripture, and Scripture's not a lie, right? Your temptations in your life are no different than what others experience. It might be a different way of a struggle, but it's still a struggle to the image disappeared. We all have those. And even though they're different, the pressures on us are the same. The pressures on us from our struggles are absolutely the same. Amen? You don't understand my pain. Mm -hmm. You don't understand my pain. You don't understand the pain I'm in. Today. Whether it be a physical pain, whether it be a spiritual pain, whether it be an emotional pain, whether it be a, 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 a financial pain. Let me say something to you. I may not, you may not understand mine, but there's one that does. And I want to share with you that old school from Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 9. says this, he was despised or rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. He turned, we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised. And we did not care. Who, who are they talking about here? Who are they talking about? Our Lord and Savior, right? Jesus, right? Do you understand this? We turned our backs on Him and we didn't even care. You know, when we don't do what God's called us to do today, we're turning it away from Him. See, God never changes. You understand that? He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And if we really get that, then we understand the only thing that changes is us. We're the ones that change. And so when we change, and you know what? When we're turning our backs against God, and we're going the opposite way of what God really wants us to go in, then we're saying to God, I don't care what you want me to do, God. And this is exactly where they were at. Yet it was our weaknesses He carried. It was our sorrows that weighed Him down. And we thought His troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for His own sins. But as you and I know, Jesus never what? Sin. Verse 5. But He was pierced for mine. Okay? For our rebellion. 
crushed for our sins. Let me say this to you. It wasn't just the religious people that put him on the cross. We put him on the cross. We're guilty, every one of us. He was beaten so we would be... Oh, ooh, I wish we grabbed grab a hold of that as a church. Stop crying being a baby. Be whole. He's made you whole. He's made you whole. Rejoice. In the darkest and in, 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 in most terrible times, He's made you whole. He was whipped so we could be what? Healed. All of, his, all of us, all of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We talked about this many times before too. Are sheep smart? No, they're dumb animals, okay? So the Bible likens us to sheep. So when you get mad at somebody calling you dumb, you're mad at the Word of God, too, because we're dumb. Sometimes we really do silly things. We do dumb things. Sheep do dumb things. They wander off. They wander off. They wander off. They wander off straight away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on Him the sins of all of us. The sins of us all. Do you get that with me today, please? Please understand, when you walk on your own, God doesn't let you go. You understand that? Oh, yes, He does, because I don't feel like He's close to me at all whatsoever. No, you walked away on your own path. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet He never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shears, He did not open His mouth. Unjustly condemned. Hold on a minute. They did me wrong, preacher. You don't understand. Okay. He was unjustly condemned, meaning he was not to be condemned, right? He didn't do anything to be condemned, right? You with me? Okay, so when you when we're in a little pity party, and I've had them, you have them, we all have them. Understand something that the one who gave his life for me was unjustly condemned. He was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. You don't know my pain, Pastor. I may not know your pain, and others may not know your pain, but Jesus does. You know, we can use all three of these excuses. We can understand that, you know what, well, we can go back on those and use it as a crutch all our life. I want, to, I want to share something with you that I was talking to someone the other day, and, and you know, we were talking, and you know, a lot of times, if you look at teenagers today, I want you to understand something. When you look at teenagers today, I ask you, I beg you as a church, don't judge them. Because you don't know what they're going through, you don't know where they've been, and you don't know what's going on in their life. Okay? Don't judge people anyway. You shouldn't. But, but here's the true thing. We are a product of our environment. You understand that? Oh, but, but my mom raised me in a Christian home. She's always been a Christian and great one Christian woman my whole life. I didn't live in that environment always. I didn't always live in that environment. But you can change it. Some do it, some don't. My friend. I had one biological brother. <laughs> to this day, honestly, I don't know if he's safe or not. I really don't. <clears throat> he uh, grew up with a, with a biological father who was an alcoholic. And we were afraid that he was drunk. He didn't have a meeting, so he gave me an alcoholic. And as I, as I started in drugs and all those things, and got me alcohol and stuff, and things, and parties, and all that stuff, and everything I saw, the road that I was going down, and I still see today, honestly, some of him and me. And I'll be honest with you, that really bothers me, because I hate the fact of even not having anything apart of him in me. Not the fact that I hate him on the I hate the part of him that is in me. And I desire to not want to be him. My desire was so strong, but I did not want to live my life like him. I want to be the best daddy that I can be, even though he sucked at being a dad. But you know what, honestly? My brother? I don't know what they prepared. My prayer still is today that if he's not on the straight and narrow now and not have life right to the Lord, that he does. 
you know, raising raising two kids and taking care of two kids and all these things and all, and then still partying and still doing illegal things and still chasing chasing girls and all more than you want to be a daddy man and you, you can easily look at it and you're like, didn't he earn? No. I hope one day he does, honestly. If he hasn't already. But you know what? So many times we judge a person when they're really just a part of their environment. And if you really go understand the end of this today, and I mean the end of the, the sermon series of what now, if you really understand true discipleship, you understand that that's how a person grows, really, in their growth of what God's looking at, and the truth, what Jonathan said this morning. As Pastor John to share with you, if 99 are looking at us as Christians, and we start judging, they're going to start judging too. I may not know your pain, and others may not know your pain, but Jesus does. Uh, you don't understand it. Saying this back to you today. Saying this to me. We can use every one of those excuses. But the Bible tells us this. You don't understand God's forgiveness. You don't understand God's forgiveness. You don't understand my past. You don't understand God's forgiveness. His mercy and His grace. 1 John 1, 9 says this. <clears throat> but if we confess our sins to Him, He is what? Faithful. And just. To what? Forgive our sins. It cleanses us from what? All wickedness. All wickedness. You don't understand how bad I've been. He does. He does. And His forgiveness cleanses us from all wickedness. From everything I did yesterday, what I'll do today, and what I'll do tomorrow. His grace is sufficient yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Are you with me? You hold yourself into that position. You put yourself in that position. You ask Him to forgive you, but you never forgive yourself. And that's why you live in what you live in that's nothing but pulling you down. And we can't truly be mature in Christ. We can't truly be ready to go. We can't truly be able to do those things if we don't understand that because Ephesians 1.7 says also, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the what? Blood of His Son and what? Forgive our sins. You know there's, there's churches today that preach the blood wasn't important. Seriously. There was a seminary in our area that was split over the fact that they didn't take blood and important to death that really matters. I believe my scripture tells me, and God's word tells me, His crimson blood washes me as what? Why does another one? He shed that blood because you got to understand something. you got to understand the whole Bible in context. In the Old Testament, how was sin forgiven by a blood sacrifice? There had to be a blood sacrifice given. And he gave the ultimate sacrifice to his life. Yes. But it started with his blood. Our God forgives no matter how fast. Amen. You don't understand God's power. I told you we finished 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 10, verse 13. Here it is. Remember, if you, if you didn't want to take notes, I'll, I'll share it back with you. The temptations in your life are no different than what others will experience. But it finishes saying this, and God is what? Faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will what? Show you a way out so that you can endure. Let me say this to you. People will preach this to you until they're blue in the face. God will not put anything on you more than you can handle. That is a lie, my friend. Straight from the depths of hell. You understand that? That's a lie. And you can go tell everyone who told you that, that that is. He will put things on you and allow things to be put on you this morning you can handle. But when you're tempted, He will show you a way that you're out that you can endure. Do you understand that this morning? If without Him, you can't endure it. And that's why you're in the struggle that you're under today. That's why you're in the bondage that you're under today. That's why you're so upset with yourself today. That's why you feel like you're not good enough and that God can't use you today. That's why you feel like your past is heads down. That's why you feel like you're in pain. It's because you're not understanding that the God that delivered you is the same God that wants to deliver you from that today. And you can walk around looking like you're something on the egg all you want to all your rest of your life and refuse to be used by Him, which is disobedience. Or you can choose today that this is who I'll serve. Now that's good preaching. He will put more on you than you can handle. But with God, all things are possible. That's scripture, by the way. Study it. Know it. Because did he put more on Job than Job can handle? But he was with him, wasn't he? And you know what? Even when his own wife tried to curse God and die, he didn't. He 
he held on to God. And the faith that he had in his God. Our God is way more powerful than our struggles. Amen. He's way more powerful than our struggles. We understand God's promise. We understand God's promise. His promise to go with you. Joshua 1 9 says this. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and what? Courageous. My friend Dale actually has that Hebrew word way this tattooed on his forearm right there. To remind him of each and every day when he's going through the battle to be courageous. No judgment because he has a tattoo. Don't mark your body up. Temperance. I believe God you mind and others. Amen. It reminds me that I have friends every one time. That reminds me that every one of them might have a story behind me. It is. It reminds me of where I was and where I don't want to get back to. But another one reminds me of where I'm going. And I'm not going to be in that man. Do not be frightened. And do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you, what? Wherever you wherever you go. Our God has promised us that no matter how painful our sin is, no matter how tough our struggle is, He'll be with us in every scene of our story. I shared with you last week, you know what? You might be in a part of your life, you might be in a part of your life that's desolate, you know, it's like the times when I went through the depression and things and I went through all that, I went through that and when I went through the breast cancer, I went through all those things, I was like, man, God, why, why, why? I was questioning God, why am I going through this? What is, what, are you, what is the deal, God? Why are you doing this to me? I don't understand this. And now I realize as I look back, it was a scene that is part of my story. And my story is my whole life. It is a scene. And if you understand the power of God, no matter how painful the scene, He'll be with you in every scene of your story. From your lifetime here on earth, from the beginning to the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. Lastly today, and here's where it really my brother meets the brothers. You. You don't understand. You don't understand. You. Must understand God's calling. God's calling. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for you. He has since the day that I was created. Since the day He breathed breath into me. The doctor spanked in my rear end didn't bring breath into me. The God who created me brought breath into me. He gave me life. Amen? It is a life that He created and it is to be returned unto Him. Amen. Jeremiah 29 11 says, We're all of us to know this. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. There are plans for good or to prosper you, some may say, and, and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Some versions say to give you hope and a future. Either way, He's given us something to hope for. He's given us a future. He knew me. He knew me. He knew me as I, before I was even knitted into my mother's womb. Do you understand that? He knew me. So God knows you. The question is, do you know Him? And if you to know Him, if you know what that means in the Bible, it says that Adam knew Eve. Are you with me? We're all, we're all old enough to understand, right? Okay? We're all hopefully mature enough to, to handle this part. So for Adam to know Eve, and it says in the Bible too that, that, that Joseph never knew Mary, but yet she got pregnant, what does that mean? They never what? Had sex. Okay? It was miraculous conception. Are you with me? He never knew her. It is a relationship, an intimate relationship. You've got to understand something. What does is, what is, what is the Word of God say? For many will say, have I not healed in your name? Have I not prophesied in your name? Have I not done this? And He will say, go away from me, for I never knew you. Hold on a minute. God knew me from the day I was created in my mother's womb. But you know what? He doesn't know you in a 
personal relationship until you're ready to have an intimate personal relationship with your God. Are you with me? He has a hope and a future for you. He has a plan for you. You have to understand God's calling. Pastor, I don't know what God wants me to do in the church. Let me tell you this. He's called every one of us to serve. Honest to goodness, truth be known, every one of us should be signed up to do something for that fall festival. It's not Pastor John. Oh, that's you, Pastor John. No, it's our job as a church to reach lost people. Oh, well, they're just having that to have that good, good fun and just having a little fall festival and everything and all. They're celebrate uh, the Hallows, Hallows Eve and all that. This is a demonic holiday. And all. No, let me tell you this. We're going to have this so that we can reach our community. The Christmas parade's coming up. When you go, everywhere you go, God will place people, I promise you, in your path that are unsaved, that are unchurched. All you got to do is invite them. All you got to do is invite them. I love Jimmy and Trish this morning. I thought about it all week this week. When they were keeping up their streaks on their home, and I thought, why are they keeping up their streaks on their home? And they all keep anyway. Um, I was like, you know, and then he, he's the man who actually took her out of <laughs> on the honeymoon. And you know the pastor called you out and they're trying to hold you accountable. I was like, man, she deserves the best, dog. What are you doing? And I was like, hey, she both take her to I hot want to take her to Waffle House next. And then she sends me a picture of their bill from the steakhouse from like before it was $180. And she was like, this why he took me to uh <laughs> Gotcha. Gotcha. Their story to me is amazing. We've been serving hot chocolate and coffee, and I shared it with a guy that she works with who used to be a pastor and, and got out of ministry, and we were talking, he's like, man, it's so tough. I was like, yeah. And I said, you know what, man? I said, we, we used to serve, just serve hot chocolate and coffee. And I said, I got so convicted one year. I was like, you know what? You know what? Why don't we go out and mingle in the crowd and invite them to church? That'd be a good concept, wouldn't it? Oh, but we're giving away something. Great. Right? But you don't get saved, and you don't get to know Jesus Christ, and you don't get have a personal relationship with Him, and you don't fellowship with other believers, when you're sitting there drinking coffee and, 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 and having cocoa, unless you're actually sitting with Christian friends having coffee and cocoa. Are you with me? And I'll never forget that day walking up and talking to him three, I think this will be four coming up, if I'm not mistaken, something like that, three or four years ago, and inviting him to church. And I had the privilege of baptizing her and her two girls and Jenny. And then doing their wedding. God is good, man. He's so good. He had a plan in every bit of that. He had a plan in all of that. He has a plan in your life too. God's plans are greater than ours. You must remember that. And they are all for a purpose. And here's the purpose I want you to understand before we get into the next part of May. A candle is in a cup. And if it does, just apply. You want to get mad at somebody? Get mad at me. Don't get mad at the church. I can handle it. There's been more people who got mad at me other than you. To bring us closer to Him, to bring others to Him, and to bring Him. Lord, that's His purpose for our life. Now, what does that look like in your life? I want I want For every one of us, the Scripture says, have different gifts, right? Right? Jonathan's going through with their teenagers right now. Spiritual gifts. And we were talking about this week, and just one of the was exhortation. And he was like, I don't understand that. You know, how can I be an exhortation and everything and all about the music? I figured the music and everything. Well, music's actually not a gift. It is a gift, but it's not one of the spiritual gifts. And he was like, look, man, to, to, to exhortation, it actually means in the Greek to come alongside. It actually also means, too, if you look it up today, in our language, it means to encourage, to exhort someone. And so to encourage. And he was like, you don't think that you're coming alongside your dad in ministry? You don't think you're coming alongside and by leading in the, in the worship team and leading in the praise band and worship? You know, do you not understand that, man? And yes, it is. And I was like, man, that's so cool. You know, we need to understand that. Encouragement of one another. You know, many of you have that gift of encouragement and exhortation. Use it. Many of you may have the gift of teaching. Many of you may have the gift. And you're not serving in the church. Let me say this to you, honestly. If you have breath in your body, you should be serving in some way or another. It's nothing more than just praying. Because trust me, if nobody else needs it, I do. We have to understand, too. You must understand God's command to go where sin Matthew 28, verse 18 through 26 is, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, which means he is also who? God. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach 
these new disciples to obey what? All the what? Say that word with me. Commands. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I give you. And be sure of this, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, he just told him to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you know what? That is a who gave that to him? Jesus. Which is a command. Are you with me? So we're to obey that command. We are to go. God commands us to go. He's sending us out. And we must be obedient to the command that this command He's given us. He doesn't say stay. He says go. He doesn't say sit there. You've already done your work. You've already got, you still got breath in your body. But just sit there. You're retired from being a Christian. There ain't no retirement in Christianity, friend. There ain't. If it ain't nothing else but encouraging your pastor to stay on what he's doing and making us fruit babies. Hey. Shout out. I can't get her to provide any contest. My liver numbers go up. You know, the, 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 the doctor said to me, don't be discouraged in it, though. Don't be discouraged in just one test. She was like, I'm going to talk to, a, to my colleagues over at Luke and see if I can get you in some, some uh, clinical studies or doing everything to and off and get that and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, look, I'm not worried. Man. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not upset. I'm not mad on that test. I know where I'm going. Can we? Let me let you make sure you know something. I know where I'm going. That's the doctor. Man. I said, but... uh." I'm frustrated because I've worked so hard to get this weight off and you're telling me I need to lose more weight. Well, not you, but the other lady. And then she told me I can eat these. You know what I'm saying? When I go to the buffet, it's a buffet. <laughs> Lastly, you know what my friends you must understand God's maturity. Make sure you're going to listen to this last few minutes. God's maturity. In you. God's maturity in you. First, first Corinthians 3 2, Paul was writing to the church of Corinth. And if he's writing to the church of Corinth, the church of Corinth, why was he writing to the church of Corinth? To tell them what? What they were doing that was what? Wrong. The wrong what? And they were doing the wrong things. But you know what I find really ironic in that in the Bible is? That he had to write two letters for them. That's why it's first and second Corinthians. I think, honestly, we need to write letters to ourselves every day. We need to understand that there's a fresh anointing in the Holy Spirit every day in our life. We need to wake up, as Jonathan said the other week, I was so convicted of that this week too. Before I'm ready to get a shower, before I'm ready to get coffee and everything, hey, pray. Before my feet get the floor. This is no joke. I told him Wednesday night, uh, on Tuesday, Wednesday morning, I woke up in the hotel, getting ready to go to my appointment, and I, was, I woke up, and I was dreaming, I was praying, I woke up, and I was praying. I fell back asleep praying, and I was dreaming, I was praying again. Oh, God. Because I, I was hearing in my mind what he said last Sunday morning. I was like, all right, I'm already praying in my sleep too. That's all right. Thank you, Lord. We've got to understand his maturity in us. 1 Corinthians 3, 2 says this to us. I had to feed you, Paul says, to these Christians. Now understand this, okay? He's talking to the Christians. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for any, anything stronger. And you still aren't ready. He's writing this to the church. The body of Christ. You still aren't ready. Hebrews 5.12 says this. You have been believers. Who, who wrote this again? Same one. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be what? Woo, 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 woo. Run the aisles today. You ought to be what? Sing it. You ought to be what? What? Teaching others. You've been believers for so long and you ought to be teaching others. What is a shame is that I, I did a nine-month-old baby's funeral who laid his daddy to Jesus Christ in his death because when he died, the next day his daddy gave his life to the Lord. He had a purpose and his purpose was he couldn't speak and he couldn't walk, but he laid his daddy to Jesus. We got people that fill our pews every Sunday for the last umpteen years and they never laid a soul to Jesus. Oh, don't get quiet. Don't get quiet. That's offensive, preacher. Good. Because as a church, that's our job. He didn't say preacher, did he? You've been believers so long, man, that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, 
you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's work. Our world has some basics in it. Pastor, why do you got to teach us about love? Why do you got to teach us about transformation? Why do you got to teach us about, about gold? Because we still have it. Oh, now you're putting the stamp, Pastor. I'm in it with you. Let me say this to you. If you could you, I'm your leader. It's way you can be me. You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. Let me say this to you. You cannot understand the fact that our past has been removed. That Satan is a liar. And that God desires to use us until we are spiritually mature. And that's why we can't do that. That's why we can't forget ourselves until we're not spiritually mature. Now let me understand this. I'm not saying you're not Christian. I'm saying he wants you to grow. If you're not growing and going forward, you're going where? Backwards. Okay? And I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to go backwards. I want to go forward. I want to go forward. When we become spiritually mature, we will get every one of these truths and we'll understand that we can't be babies in our walk forever. We are victorious. Everybody say that again. We are victorious. We are victorious. Say it like you mean. We are victorious. We are, come on, victorious. We are to grow and we're to mature in God. I didn't forget about Joseph. Okay? I didn't forget about Joseph. In the beginning, in, in, in Genesis 37. You see, the most beautiful part about Joseph's story is this. And it's found in Genesis 45. And it's not on the screen because I didn't hear this one. Because I want you to actually write it down and go read it for yourself. But I'm going to read it to you today. It says this. You can go read it for yourself. Joseph is standing no longer. In Genesis 45, verse 1. There were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out, all of you, exclamation point. So he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. It must have been pretty bad off to not even recognize their own brother, huh? Then he broke down and wept. Why? Because he had a heart brother. Really. He broke down and wept. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him. And word of it quickly spread and quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. We forget God's power. They were speechless. We pray for somebody to be healed and the doctor's telling them they're going to die and all of a sudden they're healed and the doctors can't figure it out. They're speechless because they're not God, my friend. They're the only people that can treat. God has a plan. In verse 4, in verse 5, is the, is the pinnacle of this whole story. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. Don't be upset. And don't be angry with yourselves for selling me into this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. So you sold me and you had a plan for me to get rid of me and to tell my dad and sit back my coat to him with blood on it from animal's blood and swear up and down that I actually was, was, was killed and my dad actually thought I was killed. You had all that plan, but God me out here. God sent me to this place and he had a plan that was much greater than your plan. His plan is much greater than my plan. My past is gone. My struggles are gone. My pain is gone. I understand that he is all sovereign, almighty God. He said he sent me. Joseph's dreams did not come true to fruition while right away. He told his brothers, hey, you're going to bow down to me one day. They laughed at him. They mocked him. 
He was sold into slavery, accused of rape, and in prison, but God never left his side. Remember that, I told you that earlier. Joseph was obedient and mature in the Lord. And the greatest part of his story is now told. Verse 5 is the pinnacle, as I said. It's a life statement. It's his life statement. Don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me into this place. It was God who sent me. It is God, my friend, who sends us. It is God who sends us. And if he sends us, he goes with us. You don't understand. Yes, I do. And so should, so should everyone else. We all have a past. We all have struggles. And we all have pain. We really should understand that. We really should understand that in our lives. He never promised it'd be easy. If you call us to the fire, you will not withdraw your hand. I'll gaze into the flames and look for you. But you see, my friend, you know the story if you've been here any time. You're my breast cancer. God allowed me to lead, lead somebody to Jesus. He has a plan, man. He has a plan. You understand? And yes, I do. I read the word. And so have you, I hope. I'm just really quick to forget our God's going to do this power. And Jesus promises. I want you to be today. You must understand God's calling. You must understand His commitment and be mature with Him. Because we cannot, as a great day, you know, we cannot sit still and be spoiled and comfortable baby Christians anymore. Pastor, God's laid this on my heart to go do this and everything, but I need you to hold my hand to go do it. No, go! You don't need me to hold your hand! I told him in Sunday school this morning, Kim was our director of activities. If she feels like I was needs to do something, Jonathan brought something to me the other day. He was like, hey, you know what? I think they should have a football game, a, a, a whole church-wide football game of, of, of flag football. We can have hot dogs and everything, set up seats and everything. People watch it. called a turkey bowl. Let's do it as an annual thing. We'll, we'll sell the hot dogs and everything. Maybe not make a whole lot of money. Off. That's fine. We'll get teams together and everything. We'll put the teams together, two teams together. We'll go out there and we'll play and we'll have a great time. And we'll do it on an annual thing. And whatever we take up, go to missions. Is that not what you said to go to that thing, son? So, and I was like, hey, man, go. But Jonathan doesn't need me to take him by his hand and go, okay, let me, let me take you. This is how we're going to do this and this. Go! Go! If God told you to do something, he's taking you through it. You don't need me or anybody else to hold your hand. How do we learn? If we're smart, we learn by instruction. Me and just laugh. Because what do they do with that other some ladies? They take the instructions, throw them away, don't they? You know what I mean? I love y'all, man. I can call you that. I'm going to look at the instructions. I'm going to look at them. Like, man, what in the world? I was doing something yesterday. I was like, I ain't never done this. I was like, Mike, I need your expertise. Jimmy said you're the expert. And I looked at him. He was like, I ain't the expert. I started looking. I was like, I got to read it again, I guess. Which is the front and which is the rear? I don't know. And all of a sudden, I went back. And I was like, oh, it's sitting right here on this pedestal. We can't sit still and be spoiled, comfortable, baby Christians. We gotta go. As you stand to your feet today, I want to say this to you. Just as Barabbas, and you may be wondering how in the world did he pull this from Acts? Just as Barabbas and Saul, who Saul was murdered Christians and killed God's chosen people and all these things, and then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Do you know even after he met Jesus and he was transformed? And he was changed that he was still called Saul in the Bible. Until chapter 13, verse 9, it says, Saul, who is sometimes Paul, and I'm not going to explain every single little thing to you about it, but I'll be glad to sit down with you and talk to you about it so you can know. He, he was born a Jew, but he was also a Roman citizen, had Roman citizenship. And so when he was born as a Jew, his name was Saul. And so God used that in his life all the way up until he became. Paul and the transformation happened so that he was commissioned to go after Gentiles and to lead them to God through Jesus Christ, which we are. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. They were sent out by the Holy Spirit. I say this to you today. We're being sent out by the Holy Spirit. We gotta go. We gotta go. We gotta go. We gotta go. Is it uncomfortable? It will be, I promise you. Will people use you? They will, I promise you. Will, will people burn you at times? They will, I promise you. 
when people lie to your face and tell you they're saved and they're really not, yeah, they will, I promise you. Will it be tough, Pastor? Yeah, y'all will ride it'll be tough. But I promise you the reward is greater than the work. Much greater than the work. My question for us today as a church is, what are we waiting for? Are we waiting on me? Someone said to me recently, hey, I want to go with you to the to, to the, the uh, Bright League Motel. I want to go to them and everything. What are you waiting on? I'm going already. Just ask me when I'm going. You can go with me. Oh, I can't go at that time. Then go when you're able to go. And trust the fact that God is there. And don't give up. Because He never gives up on you. Amen. God's spoken to your heart this morning. I want you to respond.
soul is found in Jesus. Oh, we ask is more of Let me see for a second. Yeah, is there, is you being sick for a second, can't we go pass this out? We're going to cut the